Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today for this SONA webinar series. I am Karen Gemini, I'm one of the coordinators of this initiative and uh, so this initiative really aims to uh, promote research and teaching in neuroscience by giving the opportunity to students and young researchers, especially in Africa, to learn and hear from renowned scientists. So this afternoon, we're very fortunate to welcome here the Professor Rubinstein, I hope I'm pronouncing the name well, from the University of Cambridge. So Professor Rubinstein is a professor of molecular neurogenetics, and he's also the deputy director of Cambridge Institute for Medical Research. So he actually received uh, his PhD in Cape Town in South Africa, then moved to the UK as a trainee and is now heading a very established and very successful research lab in Cambridge. So just some few words about you, Professor Rubinstein. Um, his work focused on protein notepatties, so autophagy, and the research goal here is to understand the link between neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's diseases, Huntington's, and autophagy. And uh, I have to say uh, his CV is very impressive, so really we're really happy to learn from you today. He uses several animals models and some conventional biochemistry methods added with high-end genomics. If I um, understood properly uh, some of his work that I read uh, today. So what is autophagy? Uh, what is the goal of your work? Uh, we're really looking forward to learn all those things today. So I'm turning the stage now to you, Professor Rubinstein, and we're looking forward to this talk. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Today I'm going to tell you about autophagy in relation to neurodegenerative diseases. Most of the neurodegenerative diseases that afflict people manifest with the accumulation of toxic proteins within neurons and other cells in the brain. So you see this with tau in Alzheimer's disease, you see it with Huntington in Huntington's disease, you see it with alpha-synuclein for instance in Parkinson's disease. There is extensive genetic and transgenic evidence in monogenic forms of these diseases that argues that these proteins, when they are aggregate prone, are poisonous for the cell. And I like to make the analogy that they're like the accumulation of rubbish in Naples. And you can see um, this rubbish is obstructing traffic and that would occur in neurons, but it's also likely to be toxic in its own right. And so for many years, my laboratory has been interesting to see whether we can find ways to enhance the clearance of the mutant aggregate prone proteins, particularly in relation to the wild type and less um, aggregate prone species. And that's how we come on to autophagy. Autophagy is a cytoplasmic process where the first morphologically recognizable compo component is this phagophore, which is a cup-shaped double membrane structure. These form more or less randomly in the cytoplasm of most cells, but in neurons, it's a little bit more polarized with more formation um, in the distal axons. After the edges of the phagophore extend and fuse, you have an autophagoso, which has engulfed a portion of cytoplasm, and these autophagosomes are trafficked on microtubules to the site in the cell where the lysomes are clustered. And in most cells, that's near the microtubule organizing center. And this enables autophagosome lysosome fusion and subsequent degradation of the autophagic contents by the lysomal enzymes. In the early years of the century, we discovered that this was a key pathway that regulated the degradation of important proteins that cause neurodegenerative diseases. So for instance, like Huntington's disease, which is caused by a polyglutamine expansion mutation, tau, where wild type and mutant forms 
give you dementias and their autophagy substrates, and alpha-synuclein, where wild-type and mutant forms of this protein um, are important for Parkinson's disease. We showed that if we impaired the formation of autophagosomes or delayed the fusion of lysomes with autophagosomes, we slowed the clearance of the aggregate precursors for these types of diseases. And in doing so, we increased the accumulation of both aggregated and soluble species and enhanced toxicity. And we did this initially in cell-based systems and then validated this in a range of in vivo systems, including Drosophila, zebrafish, and mice. So that's what happens when you've got a toxic protein in your brain. Um, autophagy makes it accumulate and makes it more toxic. But what happens if you impair autophagy in the neurons in a normal brain, in an otherwise normal brain? And this experiment was done by two Japanese groups, uh, by Noboru Uzishima's group and Masaki Komatsu's group. And they both did similar experiments by conditionally removing key autophagy genes in the neurons of mice. And they got the same results. So this slide shows, I think, the key results of the experiment. This is different sections of a control mouse brain. And below are the parallel sections of a mouse that has no autophagy in the neurons. And you can see in the mouse with no autophagy in the neurons, there's an accumulation of these inclusions or aggregates, and these end up being ubiquitinated. You also see neuronal cell loss. So this is the Purkinje cell layer of a normal mouse. You can see there's a loss of the neurons in the Purkinje cell layer of the autophagy null mouse. So this argues that you get the accumulation of aggregates and neurotoxicity even in a normal mouse if autophagy is blocked. With those data in mind, a major activity in the lab has been to try to understand if autophagy compromise is a feature of lesions that cause neurodegeneration. And this slide shows just some of the data um, from my lab um, in this context, but of course other labs have looked at this as well. The key part of the slide is not the detail, but the color code. So the blue diseases are situations where you've got lesions in Parkinson's disease, or Alzheimer's disease, um, or polyglutaminic diseases exemplified by Huntington's disease, where there is a defect in the formation of autophagosomes. The red is a situation you see in forms of motor neuron disease and Parkinsonism, where autophagosomes are built normally. However, they don't get to the site in the cell where the lysosomes are properly. The green diseases are situations where the lysosome is not working properly. And this results either in defective degradation of the autophagic contents or impaired fusion of the autophagosomes with lysosomes. And it's important to point out that these diseases are, in a sense, exemplified by lysomal storage diseases, which are the most common neurodegenerative diseases of childhood. Perhaps more importantly, we discovered that these autophagy substrates like mutant Huntington or forms of tau and alpha-synuclein, their clearance can be enhanced if we upregulate autophagy. And we initially did this with rapamycin, which induce autophagy by inhibiting a protein complex called the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. This mTORC1 is normally a negative regulator of autophagy. So if you inhibit the negative regulator, you induce the process. And we chose rapamycins because at the time we did these experiments, these were the only drugs that we knew of that were predicted to, that we used chronically in people that were predicted to upregulate autophagy mammalian cells. We showed that the rapamycins increased the removal of these types of proteins in cells, in flies, in zebrafish and mice, and in doing so, decreased the accumulation of the toxic species and alleviated toxicity and all the signs of toxicity in neurodegeneration. 
So I'll show you a little bit of some of our early data to try to make the point. So here are some experiments in a cell model of Huntington's disease that conditionally expresses a green fluorescent protein tagged version of mutant Okay, so we're back. In these cells, what we've done is we've switched on expression of the mutant protein for a day or so, and then we switched it off. And so this looks, this is what the cells look like 72 hours after we've switched off expression of the mutant protein. You can see there these aggregates. If we do the same experiment and we add rapamycin to induce autophagy in the switch off period, then you can see there's much less fluorescence, there are far fewer aggregates. And just to convince you that there are indeed cells that have taken this image with a higher gain on the microscope to convince you that it's not that we just washed away the cells. So here's another quantification in cells that are actually susceptible to the mutant Huntington. And you can see the rapamycin treatment reduces the aggregation and also ends up protecting the cells from cell death. There are fewer cells with um, nuclear abnormalities. Here's some experiments. Oops. Sorry, I'm struggling with the slides. Here's some experiments in a zebrafish model of Huntington's, of, of tauopathy, where we've expressed a, a form of tau, which predisposes to frontotemporal dementia. This is a variant that predisposes people to frontotemporal dementia. And when we overexpress this form of tau in zebrafish, we get the accumulation of tau, we get defects in neuronal arborization, we get neuronal um, loss, and um, we get abnormalities in the morphology of the zebrafish, you can see many of them have this curved morphology compared to normal zebrafish, which are straight. Um, and I should point out that we don't see those defects in fish overexpressing wild type tau. When we induce autophagy genetically in this case, using overexpression of ATG5, we get a clear reduction in the number of morphologically abnormal fish. And this is associated with the increased clearance of the mutant tau or the variant form of tau and an improvement um, in the neuronal arborization and the other morphological and biochemical characteristics of these fish. This shows one of our early mouse experiments where we've treated a Huntington's mouse model with the rapamycin analog. These mice get sick at about 12 weeks of age and die at about 25 weeks of age. And we tested these mice with four different behavioral paradigms. When we treat these mice with the rapamycin analog, we improve all the behavioral paradigms. And we have no effect on any of these paradigms when we do the same experiments in wild type mice. So I'm just showing you one of the paradigms. This is an accelerating rotor rod where you put the mice on an accelerating um, uh, cylinder and you measure how long it takes for the mice to fall off. And when they fall off, they hit this pedal, which stops the timer. So if mice have neurological impairment, they fall off more quickly. And this is the case with the Huntington's mice. However, when you treat the mice with the rapamycin analog, you increase the amount of time that the Huntington's mice spend on the rotor rod. So with those type of data in mind, and with other experiments showing that the effects 
of, of rapamycin, these types of contexts in vivo are autophagy dependent. My lab has spent a lot of time trying to understand the signalings regulating autophagy in normal physiology and also to see if we can upregulate brain autophagy for therapeutic ends. So I'm going to tell you about two recent studies from my lab that address each of those questions. The first is a fundamental physiological question, and that is, how does starvation induce autophagy? The understanding in the field is that the mammalian target of rapamycin complex one is a conserved core negative regulator of autophagy. And this is conserved from yeast to people. It's a key regulatory node that also affects translation, the ubiquitin proteasome activity, aging, and numerous other functions in the cell and in neurons. So understanding how this mammalian target of rapamycin complex one is regulated is absolutely critical. MTORC1 is a key responder to nutrient and amino acids and leucine depletion. So what I'm talking about here is if the, the conventional wisdom is that if you deplete nutrients, you impair the activity of MTORC1. A key nutrient, which if you deplete on its own, um, that causes this effect are amino acids. And among amino acids, you can rescue the effects of amino acid depletion on mTORC1 activity simply by adding back leucine. So leuc when I'm talking about nutrients, today I'm talking about leucine depletion. So we understand that if you starve cells, you decrease the activity of mTORC1, and this is increasing autophagy. The conventional wisdom, largely based on studies in HEC293 cells, is that the effects of leucine on mTORC1 and autophagy are mediated by leucine sensors that somehow regulate mTORC1 activity. So proteins that detect leucine levels per se and thereby impact the activity of mTORC1. The key part of the slide shown in the um, illustration below is that mTORC1 is a protein complex comprising a number of proteins and the Raptor component of this complex is responsible for it being tethered to the lysosomes by interactions with these RAG proteins and the tethering of the mTORC1 to the lysosome is what enables it to be activated. So when mTORC1 is on the lysosome, it's active. We got into trying to understand this biology fortuitously when Sung Min Son, a very talented postdoc in the lab, started studying an enzyme called MCCC1. It's, a, it's, it, it's within a Parkinson's genetic risk locus. And we found that when we depleted the levels of MCCC1 in cells and in neurons, we induced autophagy. And then we wanted to understand how this was working and found that MCCC1 knockdown impaired the activity of mTORC1. So this is a metabolic pathway showing the situation of MCCC1, showing leucine at the top of a pathway and showing acetyl-CoA at the bottom. So this is an enzyme responsible for one of the steps in the conversion of leucine to acetyl-CoA. In this blot, we show experiments where we've knocked down MCCC1. So this is the control. These are MCCC1 levels with different reagents that knock down the enzyme. This is a reagent, a siRNA, that hasn't worked and the others have worked. So this serves as an additional control. And we've assessed the activity of mTORC1 by measuring the phosphorylation of its substrate. Substrates S6 kinase 1, so this is the phosphorylated form, this is the total. For EBP1, another mTORC substrate, the phosphorylated form, and the total. And the substrate of S6 kinase 1 itself, for S6, so this is the phosphor S6 and this total S6. But if they all, they, they all show the same results. When we successfully knock down MCCC1, we reduce the levels of phosphorylation of the mTORC substrates, suggesting that there's impaired mTORC1 activity. 
We then look to see if the MCCC1 affected mTORC lysosomal localization. So here we've labeled mTORC1 with an antibody in green. We've labeled the lysosomes with an antibody in red. And you can see in nutrient replete conditions, you get a lot of overlap. So you get a lot of yellow signals. When you remove amino acids, you lose the yellow signals, the green and red separate, and that means that the mTORs come off the lysosome. And when you then subsequently add back leucine, the mTOR moves back onto the lysosome. You get more yellow signals again. However, in MCCC1 knockdown cells, the mTOR is off the lysosome all the time. So this suggests that there's a correlation between MCCC1 inhibiting mTORC1 activity and MCC1 affecting the lysosomal localization of mTORC1. Consistent with the metabolic pathway I showed you two slides ago, if we inhibit MCCC1, we re reduce the levels of acetyl-CoA in the total, in the whole cell, as well in the cytosol. Um, if we do the same experiment and then remove amino acids, you get depletion of acetyl-CoA. Uh, if you remove amino acids, we get low acetyl-CoA levels in the total cell in the cytoplasm, and you can rescue that by adding back either leucine or by adding at back dichloroacetate, DCA, which makes acetyl-CoA the root distinct from leucine. So let's go back to the metabolic pathway again. We've shown that inhibition of this step results in impaired mTORC activity and also reduces the acetyl-CoA levels. So we hypothesized that in the cells we were studying, like HeLa cells or primary neurons and many other cell types, that leucine is not sensed by leucine sensors particularly, but rather the leucine metabolite acetyl-CoA is directly doing the signaling. And if that is correct, one should be able to make three predictions to test. The first prediction is that when one starves cells of amino acids, one would get a decrease in mTORC1 activity, but one can rescue it not only with leucine, but with downstream metabolites like KIC, HCOA, and acetyl-CoA. And so this is tested in this plot. Here we've got nutrient replete cells and measured mTORC1 activity with the same readouts I showed you earlier. The mTORC1 activity is largely reduced when you remove amino acids, but it's rescued by leucine, KIC, HCOA, and acetyl-CoA. The second prediction is that the ability of leucine and KIC and other upstream metabolites to rescue mTORC activity after amino acid starvation should be ablated if you block the step by inhibiting or by knocking down MCC1 activity. So in normal cells, when you've not knocked down MCCC1, this is the mTORC1 activity in nutrient replete situations. You can see that the mTORC1 activity is significantly reduced when you remove amino acids, and then it is rescued by leucine and KIC. However, in MCCC1 knockdown cells, the mTORC1 activity is reduced in any case, but you get no effect of any rescue of the amino acid depletion effect when you add back leucine or KIC, suggesting that a block in the pathway here is impairing the ability of leucine and upstream metabolites to impact mTORC1 activity. The third prediction of this experiment is that when you reduce mTORC1 activity by knocking down MCCC1, by blocking the step in the pathway, you should be able to rescue it by adding back downstream metabolites like HCOA and acetyl-CoA. And this is what this experiment shows. This is the mTORC1 activity in the control situation. And when you knock down MCCC1, it goes down. And this is rescued by adding back HCOA or acetyl-CoA. These experiments led us to test the relevance of this particular pathway in a wide range of cell types. As I pointed out earlier, 
most of the previous mTORC1 signaling studies looking at the effects of leucine signaling were performed in HEC293 cells. Um, however, um, we found that the knockdowns of the previously described leucine sensors that work in the HEC293 cells have no effect in HeLa cells. And we found that this pathway where leucine doesn't signal by itself, but rather signals by acetyl-CoA, appears to act in HeLa cells, neuroblastoma cells, primary neurons, a range of epithelial cells, glial cells, and mesenchymal cells, stem cells. And we don't know the exact reason for this, but um, a clue might come from looking at the acetyl-CoA levels in different cell types, in nutrient replete medium, and then what happens when you starve them amino acids, and then back, add back leucine. So for instance, in typical cells, like HeLa cells that behave according to our pathway, the, the, the acetyl-CoA levels in nutrient replete situations are in the first lane. In the second lane, you can see that they go down a lot when you um, remove amino acids. And then when you subsequently back, add back leucine, you get a rescue um, of, of the acetyl-CoA levels. And this works in all the cells that behave according to the path I've just described. However, in HEC293 cells, you have very high acetyl-CoA levels with a very small proportional drop when you remove loose amino acids and virtually no rescue when you add back leucine. And in primary MEFs, which also don't fit with our pathway, we found that there's no change in acetyl-CoA levels when you um, remove amino acids. So these studies formed the foundation for us describing a new mechanism for autophagy activation after nutrient starvation, which is pertinent to many cell types, um, including neurons, where we also have in vivo correlative support, for instance, in the brain of mice. This pathway doesn't sense leucine itself, but senses its metabolite acetyl-CoA and does not require the described sensors that work in the HEC293 cell. This is a summary of what we found, that leucine is converted to acetyl-CoA through the path that I've described to you, and that in normal conditions, the, the abundant acetyl-CoA activates an acetyl transferase called EP300, and the EP300 results in acetylation of the Raptor components of the mTORC1 complex at a specific residue. And this acetylated raptor enables its interaction and is critical for its interaction with the RAD proteins that allow mTORC1 tethering to the lysosome that result in mTORC1 activation and decreased autophagy. When you deplete the cells of amino acids or leucine, you get less acetyl-CoA, you don't get acetylation of the raptor and this means that the mTORC1 is off the lysosomes, it's inactive, and since it's a negative regulator of autophagy, you get induction of autophagy. The next bit of work that I'm going to describe comes from our efforts to, in, to identify dr safe drugs that might be able to be used to induce autophagy in the brain. And over the years, we've performed many screens um, and studies to identify targets and mTORC regulators and mTORC independent regulators that might be able to impact autophagy. And one of our most successful studies was one published by um, or led by Andrew Williams in the lab, um, where she screened a library that was enriched in drugs that had been used for other purposes in people. This is called a repurposing study. And we wanted to see whether these drugs actually had any effects on autophagy and the clearance of aggregate prone proteins. And what we found was that all the drugs shown in this slide induced autophagy independently of the mammalian target rapamycin, and that led us to describe and characterize new pathways impacting autophagy. They led to increase clearance of mutant aggregate prone proteins like mutant Huntington, mutant alpha-synuclein, tau, etc. 
and protection in cell Drosophila zebrafish and mouse models of Huntington's disease. Indeed, one of these compounds called rulminidine, um, we've even put into people and in a study led by Benjamin Underwood and my colleague Roger Barker in Cambridge, um, we've recently published a clinical safety trial in Huntington's patients with this compound. Today, I'm going to describe more recent studies with verapamil, um, which came out of the screen. We validated that verapamil worked to induce autophagy by regulating voltage-gated calcium channels, L-type calcium channels. And Forrest Siddiqui took the study forward. We realized that verapamil wasn't a great candidate to run with in itself because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So what Forrest started with was to take a series of L-type calcium channel blockers that get into the brain or that are reported to get into the brain, which bind different sites of the L-type calcium channel and look to see if they induced autophagy in primary neurons. And to do this experiment, we used a reporter mouse for autophagy that we've generated in the lab that allows us to score the number of order lysosomes, which reflect autophagic plaques, and the number of autophagosomes. And we found that philodipine at one micromolar gave the best result. We then measured clearance of mutant Huntington in primary neurons and scored the number of aggregates as a surrogate for clearance of the autophagic substrates. Um, so we transfected normal wild type primary neurons with mutant Huntington exon one and measured the number of aggregates. And we found that all the L-type calcium channel blockers and our positive controls reduced the number of aggregates. Emboldened by these data, Ana Lopez in the group tested philodipine in our zebrafish model of, of tauopathy that I've just shown you earlier. We showed that the philodipine could reduce the insoluble tau levels in the zebrafish model and protect against the zebrafish toxicity, the tau toxicity in normal zebrafish, but not when we ablate a key autophagy gene in these zebrafish. So it suggests that the action of philodipine in this model is autophagy dependent. So then we thought we should try the philodipine in a mouse model. And so what Farah did is she used a, a first a mouse model with the autophagy reporter and used intraperitoneal injections of the drug. First, she, after single intraperitoneal injections of the drug, she measured um, autophagy using the same reporter in the neurons in the brain of these mice and found that she got the best effects. It looked like the best effect at five milligrams per kilogram in both the cortex and Purkinje cells. She then did a study for six weeks in a Huntington's mouse model where she measured the number of Huntington aggregates in the brain with increasing doses of philodipine and again found that five milligram per kilogram gave the strongest reduction in aggregates. So on the basis of that, she did a study where she measured the four key parameters um, of, of behavior that we use in this mouse um, with a five milligram per kilogram body weight um, I intraperitoneal injection strategy of the drug. And you can see that all of these parameters, grip strength, tremor, the Y maneuver, and the rotor rod are improved in the Huntington's mouse model. I haven't shown you the data, but it's important to stress that this drug has no effects on any of these parameters in the wild type mice. And we do not measure other behaviors in these mice. So this is not a selected um, report of a, a few of the things that work. These are the things that we measured and they all worked. So at this point, Farah thought that she'd be writing the paper, but we did some more experiments, which resuscitated a lot more work. And the key question was, how does this plasma concentration of philodipine in the mice relate to what you'd see in the human brain? So philodipine, we first did um, some pharmacokinetic experiments in mice. And um, after a single injection of philodipine at 5 milligram per kilogram intraperitoneally in, in the C57 black like 6 mice, we found reassuringly that it concentrates in the brain with the red line to higher levels than it concentrates in the plasma. 
We validated this because it was an important result with colleagues um, giving oral philodipine to mini pigs. The rub, the bad news was that normally philodipine is used as an antihypertensive drug in people and people take 2.5 to 20 milligrams per day of the drug. And if one takes the data from a 10 milligram per day daily dose, then people will have about 12 nanogram per mil of philodipine in their plasma. However, when we measured the levels of philodipine in the plasma of the mice at five, nano, at, at, at five milligrams per kilogram IP, we had 100 times higher levels of the drug in the plasma of the mice compared to what you'd see in a person. And that raised concerns because it meant it was possible that the effects of the drug in the mice at such a high dose might be either very much off target, so hitting another target, or could be on target and could be toxic. And that might make the drug unsuitable from, for direct repurposing in people. So Forrest spent 18 months optimizing protocols using subcutaneous mini pumps in the mice in order to achieve plasma concentrations in the mice of the drug that was similar to those seen in people. The mini pumps also have the advantage that they allow you to get fairly steady concentrations of the drug over time um, in contrast to the dramatic peaks and traps you see with intraperitoneal injection and the rapid turnover of the drugs in mice compared to people. And she optimized a protocol where she had 12 nanogram per mil in the mice, and that matches what you'd see in people. And when we measured the brain concentration of the drug at 12 nanogram per mil using this mini pump protocol, we had a concentration of the drug that was about 105 nanomolar. So first, Fara tested whether um, low concentrations of philodipine could induce the formation of autophagosomes and autolysosomes in primary neurons from mice. I mean, here the data with 100 nanomolar showing a significant induction of autophagic flux. We can see with 100 nanomolar that, and even with the um, lower concentrations, we get increased clearance of the mutant Huntington as scored by the mutant Huntington aggregates in primary neurons. And with 100 nanomolar, we did experiments in human iPS cell derived dopaminergic neurons expressing. Um, good autophagy substrate, the A53T mutation of alpha-synuclein. We then wanted to test whether this mini-pump protocol that mimicked the human plasma concentration of the drug um, induced autophagy or markers of autophagy in the mouse brain itself rather than in vitro. And first we did experiments with this protocol for a few weeks um, and measured um, autolysosome number, and although um, it's going up quite clearly, this is not significant statistically, probably because one needs much larger numbers of mice to achieve significance with this effect. However, when we measured the clearance or the reduction of Huntington aggregates in the Huntington transgenic mouse model, we found that this mini pump protocol mimicking the human concentration reduced Huntington aggregates in the two parts of the brain we looked at, the motor cortex and the peripheral cortex. We then had the challenge of trying to see if we could find a model where we could test this mini pump protocol in a mouse which shows neurodegeneration in response to a neurotoxic protein. The challenge with this experiment is that under my home office license in England, I'm only allowed to change my mini pumps once. And with the mini pump protocol we were using, we only had two weeks of reliable use of the mini pumps. So we need to have a mouse model where we could see neurodegeneration after a four week period. And by chance, Jan Sukaribik, a student in the lab, had been characterizing an A53T model of Parkinson's disease, which expresses I'm sorry, the A53T alpha synuclein mutation, which in people gives you aggressive autosomal dominant Parkinson's disease. As I mentioned to you earlier, this form of alpha synuclein is a very good autophagy substrate. And we knew that these mice from our pilot experiments got sick at about six months of age and show qu quite clear progression from six to seven months of age. So when we treat them from six to seven months of age, we can see that the philodipine 
reduces the insoluble alpha synuclein in two different parts of the brain. It improves the number of dopaminergic neurons, so you get some rescue of neurotoxicity, and improves behavioral performance. And we were very excited about this because we feel this is one of the only studies we, in fact, the only study I'm aware of, where somebody has tested a drug in the repurposing context at the express concentrations, or with the express purpose of testing concentrations um, of the drug that are seen in humans taking the compound for the other purpose. In this case, it's hypertension. So we feel that this provides strong support for the idea of further experimental medicine studies in people now to test whether philodipine at the type of human equivalent dose has beneficial effects on inducing autophagy or clearance, aggr clearance of aggregated, aggregate prone proteins. And we believe that this is justified when we look at um, the literature on the use of L-type calcium channel blockers and Parkinson's risk. So these are a series of papers on the slide which have looked at these types of drugs in relation to subsequent occurrence of Parkinson's disease in various populations. Some of these studies have looked expressly at, at philodipine and shown that it reduces Parkinson's disease risk. And these studies have also shown that the L-type calcium channel blockers that get into the brain reduce subsequent Parkinson's disease risk, while those that don't get into the brain, like verapamil, have no different effect to other antihypertensives um, or, 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 or no drug at all. So we feel that this provides further support for the, the subsequent experiments um, testing whether philodipine can induce autophagy and clearance of neurotoxic proteins in humans. Um, and if we can show that, then we can move to proof of concept studies testing the effects of philodipine on neurodegeneration per se in people. So um, today I've tried to give you a broad overview of the roles of autophagy in neurodegeneration, first showing you that autophagy compromise is a feature of many different neurodegeneration forms of neurodegeneration, including lesions causing Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, lysosomal storage disease, etc. In the second part of the talk, I described how starvation, particularly leucine um, starvation or amino acid starvation, regulates autophagy by an entirely new mechanism. And finally, I hope I've convinced you of my enthusiasm for pursuing studies of philodipine as a potential drug that fights neurodegeneration by inducing autophagy. Finally, I'd like to just acknowledge the key people, again, who drove the recent studies, Sung Min Son, who drove the leucine study, and Farah Siddiqui, with help from Angeline Fleming, Jansu Karibiek, Anna Lopez, Fiona Menzies, and um, a number of it collaborations um, mentioned below in the philodipine study. And of course, the people who funded this work without which it wouldn't have been possible. Thank you very much for listening. Yes, thank you, Professor Winstein, for your enthusiasm as uh, first, and also for this great research. We got a great overview of what you've been doing for the next, I would say, 10 years, approximately. And uh, what I can take from this message is that strategy to upregulate autophagy are really interesting, or uh, at least showing promising against neurodegenerative diseases. So I don't know if there is any questions in the audience. Um, I have some few already, <laughs> and I will start by asking them. So the first question regarding, this is a general question about autophagy. And um, so which strategy or is there any strategy to detect those early defects in the autophagy control or autophagy function? Because for what I understood from your uh, introduction is that this accumulation of proteins, which is like, for example, beta amyloid or tau in Parkinson's disease is uh, due to the defect in autophagy, but is there a way or is it known how this autophagy defect actually starts? 
where's the beginning of this problem? Okay. So I think it's a two-part question. Uh, the mm -hmm. one is, and I think um, perhaps I was uh, simplistic. I, I, I think that the accumulation of these proteins and uh, the subsequent toxicity, or the toxicity one sees in these diseases, um, is, is unlikely to be entirely due to autophagy. There, there, there'll be other mm -hmm. factors that contribute, and it's in, in many cases it's unclear um, if the autophagy is a very big player or, or a less significant player. But in many of these diseases, I think where uh, the prime driver is an aggregate pro protein that's an autophagy substrate, um, we and others have shown now in, in a range of models that one can frequently, at least in the animal models, ameliorate diseases by upregulating autophagy and getting rid of the toxic protein. The, the, the second question that you ask is, you know, um, how does one work out what's going on? I, I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so if, 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 perhaps it, it's, it would be interesting for you to, to look at some of the papers we've written um, because what we try to do is to try to elucidate the exact mechanism um, where possible um, at a molecular level to see how the aggregate prone protein itself actually impairs autophagy. And um, for instance, two years ago, we published a nature paper describing how polyglutamic expansions that you'd see in Huntington's disease impact mm -hmm. autophagy. And we described, and I think showed by chemical support, that exactly how it interacts with um, a protective protein for the autophagy pathway um, and, and thereby, um, in fact, uh, disrupts it from having its normal function. So um, I, I think, that's how we get at it, to mm -hmm. see whether it's direct or not. And we can also get an idea of the magnitude of the effect. And so I believe even a fairly small effect over a human lifetime or over decades can result in, in insignificant effects in the brain because the cells aren't dividing and getting rid of their proteins in that way. So thank you so much. So this might be a vicious cycle where the accumulation of proteins is actually impairing further the autophagy function and therefore then leading to a kind of exacerbation of the disease. Is yeah. that what you mean? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. And in fact, in fact, if I'd given you another talk, I would have told you about the vicious cycle. So you, you've got it. So, so mm -hmm. example, it, you know, Huntington, the mutant Huntington is an autophagy substrate. Okay, it's cleared by autophagy. Okay. okay, but if the autophagy substrate itself compromises its ability, to, the process that's clearing it, then you could get a stage where you start off with, okay, a little bit of Huntington and good autophagy. And then you could something could happen where the Huntington, something happens in the cell or you age and the autophagy slows down a little bit. Then you get a little bit more Huntington Mm -hmm. And that starts compromising autophagy. And so the Huntington is not removed so well, so you get even more Huntington and even less autophagy. Do you see what we're getting at? And I'm exactly getting what it. you described. I, I think we're getting it. Well, that's exactly what I think might happen. And I think there's a, the cells cope okay for decades. And then with some of these proteins, something happens autophagy gets slower with aging and something happens and when that starts happening even if it's a small effect you introduce this vicious cycle which could um lead to quite a dramatic um mm -hmm. appearance of the disease at the cellular level great thank you so um let's get down here to the molecular level because you've investigated quite a lot of stuff you showed two very large studies that we've done. We have some questions coming out also, but I'll start by this question that's lead, uh, leading to the next question. You showed that um, if you're putting the cells into a starvation mode, basically because there is a link between leucine and uh, acetylcholine, this production of energy. So if you you starve, you starve the cells, then you will increase you will increase this autophagy. So in a simple way, would that be actually a strategy? Is that the strategy that rapamycin, for example, is using to increase the autophagy and therefore leading to some benef potential beneficial effect in those pathologies? 
So I, I, I don't know if I've got the question right, but you're asking but, me whether we should all be on diets. Is that right? Whether those cells, those cells, uh, were in the brain at the brain level, where those troubles, problems happening, should those cells be on diet? Because in the yeah, mechanism, yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, I'm so trying to take it to the level where everybody, even people who are not specialists of orthopedy, can get and nail it. Yeah. So, so there is a literature in my so you it, so. So you're right. Okay. So if you starve <laughs> cells, you induce autophagy. I mean, it's, it's simplistic. But if you starve mm -hmm. an organism, if you starve a mouse, you will induce autophagy in the brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've got to stop them quite a long time, but you induce autophagy in the brain. There are studies showing that you get, if you starve mice, if you put them on, you know, uh, go and starve them forever, but if you put them on a nutrient deprivation regime, you reduce the number of Huntington aggregates in Huntington's mice. So so, so it sort of fits. The, the problem is starving a mouse for a day is like starving a person for seven days. So I said to everybody, you know, I don't want to starve for seven days. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think any of us want to starve for seven days. So I think that's extreme. Um, and so we need to find some type of mimetic for the starvation, mm -hmm. something that mimics the starvation. And so that's why we're looking for these types of drugs. Um, so I think your answer is right, um, and your question is right. But um, unfortunately, um, I like my food. <laughs> well, great. We have a question from Professor Amadi. He's in Nigeria, and he's asking, which glial cells did you investigate? What role can we assign to glial cells in this mechanism, in this process? That's an excellent question. So, you know, we looked at a glial cell line in the in the in, in the, the leucine paper. We did not look um, at primary glial cells. I think that um, it's not clear to me because I don't think the studies have been done very carefully or at all to understand the role of glial cell autophagy in neurodegeneration. In fact, these are studies that are ongoing to some extent in the lab already. Um, so I can't report on that now, but I think that's a, it, we think it's an interesting question too. And I think that um, we could learn a lot from, from studying different glial cells to see what, how autophagy impacts on, on the neurodegenerative process there. Oh, Professor Amadi is in South Africa. Sorry, I'm correcting this because I said Nigeria earlier. Well, thank you. Um, so you talked about two uh, drugs, verapamil and philodipin, which are drugs that you investigated in your studies. And this is getting us to the one subject which is on hype in medical research now, which is using drugs that have been shown to be useful in other applications or repurposing. So one general question is, would you comment on the future of repurposing strategies in medical research? Ah, oh, can you repeat the question? So the question, the first question is a general question about um, getting a comment from you about the future of repurposing strategies in medical oh. research, because this is a, a thematic which is coming on a high in medical yeah, research. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think, you know, the, the harsh lesson we learned from the philodipine study is that it is likely that many things that look uh, promising in the initial phases of a repurposing study of a repurposing study are effects of the drug that might be unrelated to the concentrations that are possible in people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've been doing some more in other contexts and our strategy now is to really start moving with the pharmacokinetics experiments to understand what concentrations are relevant as early as possible. 
so you know, I think if you if if your drug has effects at a hundred times higher concentrations than are seen in people taking the drug for its conventional indication, then um, if it doesn't work at low concentrations, you onto a hiding for nothing. So you'll have to develop a new drug, or you and you're gonna have to be very sure you're hitting the right target in that system. So I think to cut the long answer short concentration and pharmacokinetics are everything and um i think that's the big trap um that many of these studies have fallen into or that they should retest or reinvestigate so related to that question again a drug which is like used for a certain indication to move, for example a central effect has to be specific so what are the strategies that people are using to improve that specifically for the new application, for example, because this is one of the dangers that I see in repurposing, for example, a drug which is using used for peripheral indication to a central effect. Well, I think, you know, the, the, one of the main attractions of repurposing is that there will be a long history of the use of the drug and a good understanding of side effects. So a drug like philodipine, we know has very, very few side effects worth worrying about, mm -hmm. okay? And so I think, although we know it acts peripherally, um, you can move to patients with the neurodegenerative diseases once you've got enough information um, and not worry too much about the side effects. It's not like going with the new drug where, you know, often the new drugs are killed because of side effects. So, mm -hmm. so I think that is a major advantage. Clearly, there are drugs that people consider for repurposing that, that have horrible side effects. I mean, you know, if you look at the pharmacopoeia for, for these types of studies, they include drugs that are used for cancer, which, you know, they, they, they have really unpleasant side effects. And there one needs to really think carefully um, about whether you've got to pursue things. So I think one one needs to just sort of go drag by drag and understand its activity but the beauty with the repurposing if you can get lucky and and you have to get lucky with a cover yeah. you can get lucky um is that often there's a strong history of use of the drug and one knows um what one's going to expect in the patients it, because all the safety will be done and there'll be a long history of use so um you know many tens of thousands of people would have used the drug and you know what to expect, or you know what to look for. Well, thank you for this answer again. Um, are there any questions around? I don't see anything here. Well, I um, might ask then a very last question, which I think is also of interest uh, for most of the people in this audience who are looking to develop simple models so you've been using animals models, but you've also been using zebrafish, for example, which is a, an attractive model in a less gift, a research environment where people don't have a lot of, a lot of equipment, for example. So what are the challenge um, uh, in developing, so this is a generic question, developing a neurodegenerative model, for example, in zebrafish, like what, for your long, experience well the challenges have been that some of the zebrafish genetics has been lagging behind some other organisms so it's uh, mm -hmm. to make it transgenic uh for a long time it was you you could do more with mice uh we made transgenics but you had to rely on promoters that had been characterized um you couldn't do conditional expression um, it was harder to do knockouts and knockdowns. I think now a lot of that technology has evolved. Certainly, we've 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 spent major we made major efforts to try to um, develop the type of technology uh, or adapt from other people. So, for instance, in zebrafish, we can now use conditional expression using the Gulf or UAS system that people use in Drosophila genetics. We've developed systems where we can switch genes on and off. In zebrafish in vivo um, we uh, CRISPR methods where we can knock out genes um, with relative uh, efficiency and also on a certain type of a scale um, and so I think now it's becoming possible I would I, I it's it's not trivial 
I think, you know, when mm -hmm. one thinks of the model, I think the model is only good for the things the model's good for. Um, yeah. You know, the best for uh, somebody used to say, I think Sidney Brenner used to say, he said, you know, the best model organism is a person. And so, the, you know, we've got to remember that the model is just providing an approximation of something. And it's allowing, it's a tool to allow us to do certain types of experiments. So um, I think one's just got, in terms of the model, one needs to think, well, what are you particularly interested in? And what type of questions? And then what model is best for answering those questions? Um, yeah. There's no perfect uh, model. <laughs> OK, Professor well, Rabiskan, really on behalf of the Secretary General of uh, the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa, that is Professor Amadi Inhuo, and also on behalf of all the SONA members, we really express our gratitude to you for taking the time to teach us today. Uh, we might get some questions uh, remotely and we will just forward those to you. Thank you for taking this time with us today. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.